first of all, this is so compelling. It's so connecting. Um, the whole time I felt like I was in the room with you guys. And of course, I have a million questions for you. But first, I just wanted to ask, because I think the biggest takeaway for people is going to be, wow, she shares so much. Demi Lovato is no holds barred in this. Was there anything off limits for you guys? Really wasn't. Um, I think she surprised herself with just how much she was sharing. I don't even know why I'm sober anymore. I was dancing with the devil out of control. Oh, hey, be careful. Okay. I felt like I needed to tell you that I'm always careful. Demi's good at making you believe that she's okay. Demi is very good at hiding what she needs to hide. I crossed a line that I had never crossed. I think though, as the project continued to evolve and as she continued to grow and do the self work, she was even surprised at just how much she ended up wanting to share, um, which is all about the safe space and the ability, you know, to ultimately get her story out there. And I was just there to listen and document it. What is that driving force that made Demi want to open up so much? it's the ultimate catharsis you know i think these documentary premium documentary big splashy events the reason they're so popular is it's a, it's an opportunity to really speak your truth when there's so much false headlines and misinformation out there in the world here's a platform an opportunity to directly state um what's going on and and i think demi now you know she's she's worked on documentaries in the past and she talked about how sometimes when she looks back at those projects she was trying to be honest she just wasn't ready yet and i think she really was ready here and i think it shines through demi and i had a very uh, upfront conversation about our goals with this project and once those goals aligned that she really wanted to tell the truth about everything that was her goal her objective was to clear the air to tell her story to speak her truth so i think that the opportunity to really take a year and spend time allowing somebody into your world, getting that trust, and then ultimately releasing a product into the world is not so much about meticulously editing a false narrative, quite the opposite. It's about taking the time to do the self work, think through ultimately what your goal is, and then release a cohesive piece that you could share with the audience. And you could jump on live and say whatever you're feeling that day, but that's impulsive and in the moment. Whereas this is, you know, you're gonna get to know Demi Lovato um, through and through in this piece. At the end of the day, how involved was Demi with saying, yes, this can go in or no, this can't with that final editing process? There's nothing that she cut from the film. I remember the first time I showed her, the first time we sat in her theater and I pressed play and about eight seconds in, she asked me if I could, it was one of those iPads. She said, can you stop it for a second? And um, I could see she was, you know, vis she was physically reacting to, and all we got through was the scene in Rock and Rio in 2018. And she had a like physical reaction where it just overwhelmed her because she hadn't really looked at footage from that time in her life and it brought back so many memories and i'm sitting there going "Ooh, if if if, if that's all she's she's seen so far and she's reacting to it what we're in for um quite an intense viewing but she um leaned into it and anything that she made her uncomfortable she understood the power of that and you know most importantly demi's not telling anybody how to live their life everybody's got their own unique situations she's simply telling you what she's been through her unique journey and um you know, I think that will provide an opportunity for others to do the same. Just like you had to stop when you were watching, were there any moments that come to mind where you had to stop filming, where she needed a minute or moments that come to mind to you as the most powerful, intense interviews you did with her? I think one of our later interviews, you know, you're, there's always this battle because you become very close with whoever you're working with. So when something, um, so genuine is taking place, you, you need to roll. As much as your instincts are, you have to fight those urges to sort of stop um, because that's ultimately what the person wants and that's you're there to see that through. I think some of the conversations about prior trauma um, in her the earlier years of her life uh, were really heavy. We were, I wasn't sure when or if we were going to talk about those in the detail we did. And I remember um, that happening and feeling, um, it was just a really intense moment. Hello, I'm So growing close with her, spending all this time and seeing how much she was still on a journey while you were filming, 
Did you worry about her during filming? Did you lay in bed at night wondering if you were going to get a call? Because it seems everybody around her who cared was at some point still very worried. So yeah, there was some times where just heavy subject matter would stick with you and you would think about it and keep you up. And, you know, of course you, you worry a bit, um, but I really believe that uh, today Demi is, is working on herself so much and really has gotten to the root of a lot of those things that she's in the best place she's been. But again, she is, she's not fixed. We always talked about how this stuff, it's very hard to wrap up a documentary and say, that's the end on a 28 year old. She's 28 years old. So this is uh, the end of a chapter and uh, I'm really proud of where she is and, and the work she's doing. I had three strokes. I had a heart attack. My doctors said that I had five to 10 more minutes. And she, she gets into, uh, you know, how bad that night of the overdose really was, <laughs> how scary it was. I think people will learn for the first time how truly life or death that situation was. Um, how tough was that for her to relive, for her family to relive? What were those interviews like? Tough. I mean, you know, sitting down with her stepfather and mother and talking about a situation where they really believe that they may lose their daughter is difficult. And or even sitting down with her sisters, um, her friends. I mean, all of the interviews were really heavy. Um, this film, you know, Dancing with the Devil, ultimately is about a moment in time. Obviously, that horrible incident where the overdose occurred and ultimately how we got there. You know, it's ultimately this like nucleus and you peel back the layers of the onion in it and it all leads you uh, in a nonlinear way to this moment. And every interview touched on where you were, what happened, what went through your head, you know, dur during that incident. And as such, all of them were really difficult. Is she alive? People are gasping. Her oxygen levels are dangerously low. I said, what do you mean if she's gonna make it? You're watching all of her blood come out of her body into a machine. She was like, I can't, I can't see, I can't see anything. I would say for sure the the conversation with her parents was just as, as much prep work as I did was really tough because you could just see the pain as they sort of relived it. And I think a lot of the people that I sat down with hadn't properly spoken about it in the open to this level at any point, you know, because when you're in it, everybody just wants Demi to get better, just get better. And then ultimately as time, it's not something you just chat about every day. I'm engaged. I've really struggled with this. So much continued to change while you were filming. She got engaged, she became unengaged. Again, in theme with everything else, like, to ignore that she fell in love, she did. I mean, that was, she She fell fast, you know, quarantine was such a bizarre time for people. Uh, loneliness, um, you know, uh, was, was prevalent. And to leave out Max entirely felt like it would have been, you know, inauthentic. So I felt it was important to have Demi do some of those self-taped uh, confessionals of saying, hey, I know your goal here is to be authentic. I think you should take five minutes and diary you know, uh, do a visual diary of how you're feeling. And that was super powerful when she sent me, um, she sent me the first video, which was her kind of putting on uh, her best game face, talking about how she was pushing through. And then later that night when she was still up and couldn't sleep, she sent one where she was really, you know, letting the tears out. And that's again, another example of she really was going there. She wasn't afraid to show her emotions, wear her heart on her sleeve and, um, talk about everything going on. Demi does say he fooled her and her friends say he fooled her. That happens a lot. I was wondering, is there an explanation there? Like, did, did she not want to explain how? Cause you are sitting and watching and saying, well, how did he fool her? My takeaway there, and we spoke about it at length was, you know, quarantine made people move fast. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it takes time to really get to know somebody. And I think they both moved too fast and then they ultimately got to know one another. And I think had it not been quarantine, maybe they wouldn't have been living in the same place so quickly and all of those things. So I think as they both started going back to work and whatnot, um, you know, ultimately the relationship wasn't right uh, for both of them. We see uh, some cameos for, from some big names. <laughs> Christina Aguilera pops up and Elton John and Will Ferrell. How much did that mean to, to Demi? And, and what did you think of these huge people coming in to sit down and, and speak on her? Well, I thought it just, it, it was another key perspective. I mean, she's influenced other icons, you know? Uh, she has this incredible um, relationship, um, like sister relationship with Christina, who's gone through 
Um, some similar stuff and ultimately I think has been a really great soundboard for her um, and has been a real mentor at times. Uh, Elton John, another one who's had similar struggles in his life in different ways and um, ultimately provided a very different opinion even on um, where he stands on sobriety and how to go about it. Uh, and then Will Ferrell, uh, a very little known uh, real <laughs> per personal relationship though where, you know, uh, I think Will's moment is so special and, and, and heartfelt. And you go and you see Demi has obviously 100 million people following her, on, um, following her on Instagram. She's got fans all around. You hear from her family and those closest to her. And then ultimately to go and see the impact she's also had on some of her contemporaries. It's just, it, it really to me rounded out the whole um, project. The big conclusion at the end, maybe the big reveal at the end, is that Demi is not sober, is that she is drinking and smoking weed in moderation. Um, how did you feel ending with that? Are you worried about how her fans might take it, about how the world will take it? Have you talked to Demi about the response to that and what it will be? We did, we talked about it and in the documentary, uh, we were very careful to not preach any uh, one size fits all solution and very careful to say that nobody struggling with these issues should follow Demi's lead. Demi is um, exploring what works for her very actively. She's still figuring out what works for her. Um, this is her truth. And she's not saying it's perfect. She's saying that she's figuring it out. So uh, it was important to me and to us. And, and, and I felt the responsibility also to include other opinions of people that don't feel like the path she's taking is the right one. And again, we're also saying that the rest is unwritten. I mean, there's a very powerful moment when she says, you know, you're not going to go and open up a TMZ article and see me as the headline in a negative way again. Um, but I say that with humility and knowing how it, that it's a powerful uh, disease. So I think that, again, you know, for me, the goal is to provoke dialogue and to talk about uh, these issues and to destigmatize it all because people go through it. Everybody's uh, got their own unique struggles and journey. And the best thing to do is seek help if you're able to. The best thing to do is talk about it and not just allow it to live in your head and nowhere else. So uh, I do anticipate a conversation to start. Uh, and I hope that it ultimately helps people, quite frankly. I'm rebirthing. I am starting over. I'm engaged. I've really struggled with this. Are you entirely sober now? I've had a lot of lives, like my cat, you know, I'm on my ninth life. I'm ready to get back to doing what I love, which is making music. I'm not living my life for other people or their headlines or their Twitter comments. Bye. <laughs> How do you think she does feel about the final documentary? I think she feels liberated. I think she feels like she doesn't have to walk around with the facade or wondering, are people gonna pick up on this? Or, you know, I've said I'm the poster child for that, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm really doing that anymore. People evolve, people grow. And, you know, there's, no, there's gonna be no aha gotcha moment after this. She says, I am a work in progress. I understand what a serious disease addiction is. I understand that I am battling X, Y, and Z. I mean, you'll see the film, but yeah. she ultimately is saying, I am working on things every single day. I've put systems in place because I am a flawed person. Here's where I am today. And I'm, I'm here to tell you my journey. So um, I think she's really proud of the work and excited that people will know Demi for Demi.